This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. I want to welcome all of you to another edition of Silent Voices. Uh, beside me is Maria Malin, and we're at the Capitol in Lansing, Michigan today for a special edition of Silent Voices. Maria, why are we here? We're here to bring attention to child abuse that takes place, court-licensed court abuse, and children that are in general placed in abusive homes. Um, we're standing up for the children, and we hope to have a really good turnout today here in Lansing, Michigan. Let's go to a few of the sights and sounds of uh, the rally here in Lansing. Renee Beaker is the founder and president of the National Family Court Watch Project. Okay, is it better? Yeah. <laughs> Renee Beaker is the founder and president of the National Court Watch Project a speaker and advocate for reform of the judicial system since 1996. Renee is a respected contributor, contributing member to the many professional and grassroots organizations. Renee has been an invited speaker at numerous conferences around the United States. Renee's article, The Illusion of Protection Uncovered, review of the special journal issue on child custody and domestic violence published in the February March 2006 issue of Domestic Violence Report. Renee designed a comprehensive court watch observational instrument that, used, that is being used in the National Family Court Watch Project. She serves on various committees both in her state and nationally. Renee holds a master's degree in educational leadership from the University of Mount Union in Ohio as well as a Bachelor of Science degree in organizational communications from Eastern Michigan University. Please welcome Renee Beaker. Hello everybody. Really a sad topic to have to come and meet here at the Capitol with regard to. I've been working on this issue for a long time and after spending countless years attending conferences uh, activist conferences, judicial training conferences, domestic violence conferences. I heard a lot about what was wrong with the system and why the court system seemed to be failing to protect especially children and women in domestic violence situations, but there was not a solution. I, I wasn't hearing of a solution. So I went home and <clears throat> talked with a few people and I developed a court watch project. This project is, it took a little bit of time to put it together, but it's, as far as we know, the only project that focuses nationally with a instrument that was developed that we use in every state. So it's the only standardized instrument. The goal is to collect data. That's looking at the same data points so that we can have a baseline understanding of what is happening within the court system. So far we have been in six states, excuse me, and we've looked at, hold on, Windy and Papers. Our goal was to take a look at some of the demographics, who is in court, who is the uh, petitioner, who is um, the respondent, who has representation, 
if abuse is being addressed at all in the family court. And just sort of to get a generalized understanding of the environment in the family courtroom. Some, some of you probably already know, this is a quote, my own quote, that family court has become a very dangerous place for women and children, especially if abuse is an issue. Women remain at disadvantage in protecting themselves and their children. Um, in the article I wrote, The Illusion of Protection, way back in 2006, that article is extremely relevant still today. When I wrote that article, what we are seeing today happening in family courts and courts that are involved with child protection are far worse than when I first wrote this article. Um, studies show, this is an old study too, but it's relevant. Studies show batters convince authorities that, victim, that a victim is unfit or undeserving of sole custody in approximately 70% of challenged cases. Now, family courts are a special court. They deal with issues affecting families. And one of the things, a method for affecting change in the courtroom is having this, what I call, action uh, research, which is observing the family courtroom and, and paying particular attention to domestic violence. None of the court watch programs that I investigated early on were actually looking at family law. They were looking at domestic violence, but they were not, and they were looking at criminal cases, but there was no one looking specifically at what is happening in the family courtroom. So that's how I determined we needed to have a, what I call standardized instrument. Grassroots action research is important and necessary research. So you need to keep that in mind. You are and can do research. You are part of research and you can become research, especially the individuals speaking here today. They're very knowledgeable what has occurred to them. They are the experts on their story and they should write about it and they should speak about it. So who did I involve in this project? Believe it or not, I have a lot of universities that worked with us, U of M, MSU, Oakland, Eastern, and other universities outside of the state. They utilized this program either as an internship, which I supervised the student, or a classroom project. And then we had volunteers such as paraprofessionals, uh, volunteer um, individuals in the community, a retired attorney is actually one of my board members. We've had um, across the board various different types of people coming in and working on this project. And the students, uh, when they work on this project, they write a first impression paper for me so I have an idea of what their thought or what they think a family court involves. And they, I train them, they do this research, they go out, they observe, some of them typically three together. Um, we have like over 350 hours in Washtenaw County alone. Um, so having students go in, court watch, they give me the instruments, but they go in a database, and then they write a paper about their experience after that. You'd be amazed at the epiphanies these individuals, these students um, have flash across their face and several of them have decided to go into law school. So it is an important program and learning program and um, we've learned a lot about what is happening in the courtroom. I'm sure many of you are aware about 60% of litigants are without representation. In the civil court there is no pro bono attorneys. Most families when they go into family court if they were poor to begin with are even more poor when they finish. They often wind up walking from family court directly to bankruptcy court. Now, I don't have statistics on that, but I can say anecdotally, that's pretty accurate. So we did, oh, close to 800 observations. We dumped some because if a student didn't sign the forms, then I didn't validate their, their work. Um, so 31%, I'm just going to give you some short 
data. Um, it should not be um, quoted because we're still evaluating. Unfortunately, it's a slow process. 31% approximately of the cases were not heard or completed. That means people went into court, either took a day off work, babys a babysitter paid, paid for parking, paid for an attorney, went in to the courtroom and either the case was postponed or um, somebody didn't show up. But these kinds of things concern us because of the cost of attending co court to begin with. Uh, we need to find a better way in order to serve the public better. And that is if a court case isn't going to happen, we shouldn't have people missing work, paying lawyers, and driving into a courtroom. Another thing, uh, in these particular cases, 28% of the time respondents were not present. Um, and some portion of that time, some member wasn't present, either a respondent or a petitioner, but rulings were made. We have a problem with that as well. Um, if, a, if a domestic violence situation is happening and a protective order is issued, that doesn't worry us so much as a custody issue is uh, presented or some other piece of the case is ruled on. You don't have both parties present. They're not necessarily aware and they won't necessarily know until there's given that piece of paper or it's mailed to them because remember 60 percent of these people are not represented so there's a real problem with notice knowing what's going on in court knowing you have to be in court notice is a huge problem And we do have other breakdowns about, you know, men and women and, you know, how many and, and what. Uh, but we, uh, today I'm not sharing that. One of the main issues we were concerned about is about 25% of our sample abuse issues were brought up. And when you have concern for safety of victims or children, uh, the, the issue wasn't always addressed and that's a concern. In one example, our court watcher witnessed a gentleman who was, in this case it was a gentleman, who was in the court and it became clear during the hearing that there was an arrest warrant for him. The judge did not arrest and have him removed and that was an error. They should have dealt with that um, arrest warrant right then and there. So that's that kind of um, is, well, it's a huge concern. I mean, if there, if there are people in court and there's an arrest warrant, they should, be, they should be arrested. Another issue that we are greatly concerned with has to do with interpreters. For a lot of people, that's not a problem, but if English is your second language and you do not understand the nuances of what is occurring in a family courtroom that will affect you or your family, that is a huge civil rights violation and that needs to be addressed and there are courts in our state who aren't doing it and I have talked with court administrators with regard to that issue and I understand money is the problem but we it's a civil rights issue you have to do it you have to find an interpreter so that litigants understand what is happening that will affect their lives Another issue that is huge within the family court is there are upwards of 70% of battered women who lose custody of their children. And well, I want to say, I want to say, in more than 50% of the time, it's it's probably it's probably somewhere between 56 and 70%. This is a problem. Um, and a parental alienation is one of those issues that seems to be cropping up awful lot in family courtrooms. It is scientifically invalid. It is being used and it should not be. The National Council for Juvenile and Family Court Judges has in uh, uh, 2029 uh, wrote that it should not be used against um, a victim of abuse and that it may often change the focus of abuse and the abuser. Um, 
and as used as, as an excuse, if you will. So we need to be really careful about junk science being utilized. And the National Council for Juvenile and Family Court Judges is a, a very good judicial training organization. And I think that judges and courtrooms need to be maybe looking at uh, publications and go to training to find out that these things are already called scientifically invalid so that they're not utilized in a courtroom against a victim of abuse. Another interesting piece that we found, the oldest case in our database is 14.9 years. When a case is 10 years old, more than 60% of the cases in our database are still going to court on custody issues. That's a red flag for us. That a family is still dealing with child custody 10 years after the initiation of a divorce means somebody didn't do something right the first time. And there's this strict sort of idea that when we set custody when a child is three or one, that somehow that should live with a child for their lifetime is off kilter. Children grow, children change, children sometimes would like to get a job play a sport or be involved in an activity and they have an archaic set of rules that the court is unwilling often to change and the the real frightening thing is that families for the most part those who are not in court battling every five minutes are fluid and we need to have court rules and court orders that are fluid for families as well so it's just a snapshot because I didn't have but only 15 minutes or so um, to share with you that this project we feel is an important project while there are some court watches around the country now that have sprang up my my mantra is that we need to utilize one instrument so that we have a good baseline then we can take an instrument and alter for a particular area say if you have a judge that's problematic and needs and has a need to be paid attention to or there's um, other issues that need to be addressed so uh, if you are a professor or in, involved with the university uh, as I said I've had several universities and lots of students to supervise please go to our website the National Family Court Watch org and uh, contact me if you're interested in working on the project. I will, there's a caveat. Individuals who are currently in a court case do not court watch, and there's a reason for that, because of bias. So that's why we utilize stu students from various programs at universities or um, paraprofessionals or others who have not been involved. Thank you very much for all the work that you do, and I'm so, I'm so sorry for the families that have suffered either a loss or injury to their child. There's so much work we have to do. I wish we had a magic wand to solve all this, but the bottom line is that the court system is a cornerstone, and until it operates correctly, we can't protect our children. Thank you. I'm going to see if I can balance. Wait, there's a lot of things going on here. Hold on. Sorry. Let me just get settled. Can you hold it for one sec? Let me just get settled here. It's not my phone. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be here with you today. Thank you so much. Um, when Barbara reached out to me and told me the story of her grandson, my heart broke. Her letter was really hard to read because I'm a grandmother too, and I know that I could never imagine what it might be like to lose my granddaughter, especially the way that she did. And I learned Wyatt's story. To think of the violence against this little boy who did nothing wrong and thank God he is still alive and with us today thank God you know <clears throat> I read that uh, Wyatt is learning to talk now Erica his mom tells me that he's using little words like 
animals. Yes? Yes. Yeah. And that he smiles every day. Oh, yeah. What an incredibly brave little man he is. And I just want to say to Erica and to Barbara and to Cheryl and to Jesse and to all of you here, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing because it is so important. But the fact is, it never, never should have come to this. And that's why we're here. We're here for our children and our grandchildren. They deserve to be safe. They deserve to be protected. They deserve all the love and support we can give them. And you know what? It's not talked about very much, but children have rights too. They may be little, but they are people. And they have thoughts and feelings and hopes and dreams. That's why if we can pre prevent child abuse, we must act because it is on us to fight for our children. This means taking action before anything happens. It means passing and strengthening laws to help parents identify child abusers. It means giving parents the resources to make informed decisions and know everything they possibly can about who is interacting with their child. A report of child abuse is made every 10 seconds. And we know that there are countless children in Michigan and around the country who are abused by their caretakers on a regular basis. Children who have no one else to defend them. They need our help. I have been a fighter for victims of child abuse my whole life. Even more as a mother and a grandmother. That's who I am. And like all of you here and countless parents across Michigan and the country, I believe that no child and no parent should ever have to face the evil that is child abuse. And I believe that politicians in Washington need to step up and do their jobs. They need to do their jobs and protect our children. And in Congress, I promise you, that I will go to the ends of the earth to strengthen laws that prevent child abuse and give parents every tool available to protect their child. I promise you that I will fight for our children, I will fight for their future, and I promise you that I will fight for a world where all children are safe. Thank you, thank you. If you would like to be a guest on Silent Voices, contact us at miparentalrights at gmail.com. That's miparentalrights at gmail.com. We'll be back after these messages.
No longer victims, but survivors. Rise up, survivors, be silent no more. All who abuse and all corrupt who take their side. All surviving victims, now declaring war. Silent voices, no more. We will not be ignored, we are here to settle the score. Silent voices no more. As long as children are battered, as long as justice is for sale, until corruption is dismantled, our warriors will never bail. Silent voices no more. We will not be ignored. We are here to settle the score. Silent voices no more. Silent voices no more. And I want to thank each and every one of you for joining in today for a special edition of Silent Voices. You can catch us next week, same time, same channel. Until next week, my friends, remember, your, your voice can, can make, make the difference. difference.